what you need to consider when you're publishing in Scopus Index Law Journals. And I'll also talk about uh, the need for uh, publishing in Scopus and uh, I'll also give you some tips with regard to some do's and don'ts. Uh, so before I uh, start this presentation, first of all, I must say that I'm a bit intimidated because I'm making my presentation before two of my professors, Professor Bismi and Professor Girishankar sir. So it's really a uh, great um, matter of honor, but at the same time, I'm feeling a bit intimidated, but nevertheless, I'll get down to my business. Uh, so as far as the scheme of today's uh, presentation is concerned, what I'm going to talk, uh, it's not actually going to be a presentation, it's going to be a dialogue. So if you uh, have any questions and if you uh, want to interject at any moment, uh, please feel free to uh, jump in. Okay. Uh, so uh, um, basically what I will do is I'll talk a bit about uh, firstly the caveats because I think um, uh, there are certain uh, um, um, limitations as far as uh, the, the dialogue that we are going to have for the next one and a half hours is concerned. So I'll talk about the caveats, then I'll talk a bit about Scopus and why should you publish in Scopus indexed law journals. Then I'll talk about the need uh, for research and writing to become a pedagogical habit. So for all of us, as far as our teaching methods are concerned, I think it's very important that we interlink research and writing with our teaching responsibilities. And thereafter, I'll speak about level, 11 um, do's and don'ts that you may consider while uh, while uh, is that writing for Scopus Index Law Journals. Okay, so this is a broad scheme uh, of what you can expect for the next one and a half hours. Now, as far as the caveats are concerned, first of all, I must say that um, unlike what Neeti has just now said, I'm still a struggler as far as publication is concerned. And um, particularly with regard to Scopus pub Publishing. Now, Scopus public Publishing has now become the in thing as far as uh, academic systems. So uh, the, the do's and don'ts that I'm going to mention right I mean here, many of you may already be aware of it. I know that a few of you might be past masters as far as research is concerned, but still it's always good to you know, once again reflect on these do's and don'ts. But the problem with these do's and don'ts is that they are highly subjective. So these are things that have worked for me, but it may not necessarily work out for you. And what works for you may not necessarily work out for me. So it is something uh, you know, like uh, we have to develop our own style, our own system of uh, how to do research. Because there can never be a one size fit all uh, approach as far as legal research is concerned. As you all know that research is a very unique experience. So it's basically a very personal uh, experience that you have to enjoy and you have to build on it. Uh, so what I suggest that you people, I mean, all of you must do is that uh, you create your own map as far as legal research is concerned. But uh, in the next one and a half hours, what I will be doing is I'll give you certain pointers and you may want to refine on those pointers. So because it's all about uh, the need for publication, the need to do more research and how to do research, I might sound a bit preachy here. So please do bear with me. Okay. So now I'll come to the, um, the, the, the need. Why Scopus? Why is Scopus so important? Now, if you, like what Neeti has already said, Scopus came, uh, was established some, sometime around uh, 2004. And since then, uh, it, has, uh, it has assumed a lot of traction as far as the academic field is concerned. So Scopus is now considered to be a main requirement for most universities worldwide because most uh, uh, global rankings they use Scopus, they take Scopus into consideration when they rank universities. So whether we like it or not, we have to live with Scopus and we have to navigate within Scopus. Now, when you, when you uh, think about Scopus, it's not a tetrahedral uh, monster or anything of that sort. It is just like uh, publishing in Scopus is just like publishing elsewhere in any other journal. But you have the same writing process, you have the same research process, you might have to undergo through the same rejection process. There will be acceptance. There will be multiple revisions. But what sets Scopus apart, at least as far as the creme de la creme journals indexed in Scopus, what sets Scopus apart is the fact that you are uh, put to put into a very rigorous uh, review process. So when you submit an uh, article to most Scopus publications, particularly the good ones, you have a double a blind review, a peer review process. So what happens is that your paper will be reviewed by your peers 
and you may be fortunate enough to get two sets of uh, comments so that so what happens is that you get two sets of comments and when you incorporate those comments into your paper your paper ultimately will become an independent piece of scholarship so that is your contribution as far as legal research is concerned to the legal uh, academium so that is why scopus is most important now you must understand that Scopus is not a journal. I'm sure most of you know about that. Scopus is not a journal. Scopus is only an index. It is only a list of journals. It is an index maintained by the company is actually run by a group by name Elsevier. Now, what Elsevier has done is it has uh, it has reviewed a long list of journals, and out of those journals, based on certain criteria, it has actually picked a few journals and put it into the Scopus index. So when you publish in Scopus. What happens is that you get an opportunity to publish in some of the best law, I mean, um, some of the best journals in the field. Because Scopus is not only about law. Scopus is multidisciplinary. So you have economics, uh, you have management-related uh, journals, you have um, banking-related journals. So you have a whole set of journals um, indexed in Scopus. And I think uh, most of you might have already visited the website. It's scopus.com. Uh, those of you who have not, I encourage you to please visit the website. And you will find that uh, Scopus, as of now, has got about uh, 43,132 journals that is indexed in Scopus. And these cover a broad spectrum of disciplines. Now, out of this 43,132 I mean, journals indexed in Scopus, about 942 journals deal with the subject of law. So you only have 942 law journals indexed in scopus now uh, when you look at scopus when you go to the scopus website you can create your own independent profiles and uh, you can create your author profiles and you can search you can do a lot of search to find out which journals are indexed in scopus and you will also get to know about the site scope there is also an, uh, a very important uh, icon as far as the Scopus website is concerned, and it is called the Scopus, Scopus, Scopus coverage years. Because what happens is that uh, sometimes a journal, journal may be, uh, may be uh, discontinued. The Scopus may take it out of the list. So you should always, before you submit an article to Scopus, I mean a Scopus indexed um, law journal, you must always verify whether the uh, journal continues to be recognized by Scopus. Now, if you look, like I told you, we only have 942 law journals in Scopus. Now, if you look at the list of law journals, you'll find that uh, there is a lot of underrepresentation as far as U.S. law journals are concerned, and this is uh, mainly because most U.S. law journals are edited by students. But as far as Scopus is concerned, there is an element of um, uh, what is that seniority, uh, academics, or people who are experts in the field get the opportunity to um, review the papers. So that is the difference between US law journals and uh, Scopus law journals. Now, I told you that Scopus mainly consists of uh, um, 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 journals, index journals, and Scopus also contains a book chapter. Book chapters are also included in Scopus. But you must understand that as far as book chapters is concerned, uh, authors may find themselves at a disadvantage because only very few book series have been included within Scopus. For example, there is a series by published by uh, Brill. It's called, uh, Brill is a book company, famous book company. So it's called International Environmental Law Series. Now that series has been recognized or indexed in Scopus. So what happens is that when you publish a, a book under that series, it automatically gets uh, recognized as a Scopus uh, indexed book. But then what happens is that uh, there are lots of other books which do not fall within a specific series and they are not indexed in Scopus. So when you are uh, invited to write a book chapter, what happens is that if you want it to be Scopus, you have to make sure you have to correspond with the editor to find out whether uh, the book, the book which is going to be brought out, is it Scopus indexed or do they have a, 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 a proposal to submit it to Scopus for Indexing. Now, Scopus has got an empaneled set of publishers. For example, uh, Springer. Spring, Springer is actually empaneled by Scopus. So, if you publish with Springer, Springer, the good thing is that they will automatically send the book to Scopus for indexing. And of course, Scopus will, uh, based on a different criteria, will evaluate the book. And then finally, it will make a decision as to whether the book should be Scopus indexed or not. 
so that is a major problem so when you uh, publish with local publishers there is no uh, scope to include it within scopus because what happens is that scopus has got an empanel set of publishers and it has to fall within that empanel set of publishers so when you are if you are planning to write a book please be very careful because and go for a good publisher because otherwise your all your efforts will prove out in prove um, i mean will go out in uh, vain so then uh, what happens is that with regard to books the um, the result can be it can take much time it may take even years before scopus comes out with a decision as to whether the book should be indexed within scopus or not but with regard to articles of course because the journals are already recognized and indexed in scopus you automatically get a scopus recognized publication okay so this is this is what i have to tell about scopus so when you talk about scopus please understand that it is just an index and all that you need to do is find out whether the journal that you propose to publish your paper is it indexed in scopus or not if it is indexed in scopus go ahead but please find out whether it uh, the, the journal is, has got a current uh, recognition by scopus so these are two important aspects that you must keep in mind before publishing in uh, scopus index journals now i told you that with regard to publishing in scopus it is like publishing uh, any other paper the same principles apply so you have to go through the same process but what makes the scopus process a bit different from ordinary other um, run of the mill kind of publication processes is the fact that in scopus the process can be more rigorous so before we get into the do's and don'ts as to what you must uh, consider what you must keep in mind uh, when publishing in scopus you must first of all ask yourself why should i publish what is the need to publish of course most of you are uh, uh, teachers in um, universities and law schools so you already have a, 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 a settled job so then the question is why should i publish because i'm teaching already i'm already doing uh, let's say 16 hours of teaching a week so why should i publish what is the purpose in publishing now if you look at uh, the overall global uh, publishing scenario you will find that india figures at the bottom when it comes to publishing and research we give a lot of emphasis on teaching in fact most of our universities are actually teaching shops they focus primarily on teaching and there is no talk about the importance of research and publishing and what happens is that we tend to consume more and more knowledge particularly we tend to consume more and more eurocentric knowledge so concepts in administrative law in constitutional law public law concepts developed in england we tend to consume them we don't critically evaluate those concepts and we don't create new concepts in administrative law constitutional law and other, other things so the problem that happens is that a lot of uh, activity legal activity is going on within indian courts within india's legislative framework okay but the problem is that as far as knowledge is concerned as far as scholarship is concerned we are producing very little see as you know that uh, we are 1.25 billion people and uh, we have the common law system so there's a lot of legal problems and economically we are booming also so we have a lot of lot of legal problems and we need legal solutions to these problems so there is a lot of scope for doing research in india people the whole world wants to know what is happening in this country but unfortunately we don't produce knowledge we tend to consume what is happening in the west so we tend, uh, most of our universities what happens is that the teaching process mainly is directed towards disseminating knowledge created by others in the classroom we don't we don't contribute anything anything new as far as knowledge is concerned and as you all know as an academic we have two primary responsibilities one of course is teaching but the second one which is perhaps highly important if not more important than teaching is research and publication so why do you want to publish in uh, um, uh, scopus index law journals one of course it can help build your cv it gives you credential academic cred credibility second one is it helps your institution to break into the rankings to move up the rankings now, as you know that uh, jindal global law school has now been ranked as uh, the 70th uh, best in the world okay now one of the primary reasons as to why jindal could um, reach this uh, this uh, this rank of 70 is because we focus a lot on scopus publications so most of our faculty 
uh, they get opportunities to publish in Scopus. So that is what is pushing Jindal up the global rankings. So rankings, as far as an institution is concerned, rankings is extremely important. And for that, Scopus becomes a very important parameter. So what happens is that first for an academic, publishing in Scopus is important because it builds your CV, it gives you uh, credibility in the academic field. And second, it helps your institution move up the rank. More importantly, what happens is that when you publish, and when you publish in Scopus indexed uh, law journals, you are creating knowledge. And this knowledge will be, will be uh, read, it will be discussed, it will be debated upon, it will be critiqued by your peers. And you have an opportunity, a golden opportunity to move out from a classroom where you deal and where you interact only with 60 students. Now you get an opportunity to meet people from all across the world. So that is the importance of publishing in uh, publishing and of course in publishing in Scopus Index Law Journals. So you get an opportunity to create a dialogue, a dialogue and you get an opportunity to create future dialogues because you might end up in um, providing the platform for the development of more scholarship in the, in the area where you have written. So that is very important. So what happens is that you also get an opportunity to be cited. So scholars around, around the world, they may cite your work if it is published in a Scopus in this journal, that will give you more credibility. And you might be cited even in uh, some of the world's leading law journals. And in certain cases, your papers might become reading materials for academic programs elsewhere. So it is through this process of writing, only through this process of writing, that we can reach out to the world. Otherwise, we'll end up in a small class classroom. So it's, it's up to you to decide whether I want to end up in a classroom or do I want my voice to be heard elsewhere. So that is the reason why I think it's very important that research you have to publish. It's very important for an academic to spend most of its time, most of his, uh, uh, his and the time available to him to publish. So like I said earlier, research and writing has to become a sort of a pedagogical habit. And here you cannot disassociate the process of learning and teaching from writing. So teaching and writing go hand in hand. Like in fact, uh, Professor Madhav Menon used to often tell me that, uh, see, if you want to be a good teacher, you have to be a good researcher because they are integrally connected. Research can contribute to effective teaching and teaching can give us new ideas which we can use to further your research agenda. Research can also help reinvent what you are teaching. So I had the opportunity to teach water law. And when I got this opportunity to teach water law, what happened is that there was not much, there were not many papers as far as water law is concerned. So I was first asked to do research in water law. So I read cases, I read, um, uh, what is that, uh, legislative material. I wrote papers on water law. And finally, because of the research I did in water law, I was able to offer a course, an entire elective course on water law. And even today, I offer this course on water law. So what I'm saying is that research can contribute to effective and more rigorous teaching. Like I said, a good teacher, a good teacher has to be a good researcher. And uh, when you teach, like I, like I said, it's mutually uh, interconnected. So when you teach, uh, the students may ask you questions. So those questions might create, might um, actually ignite your thought process. And you might find that there is a good research question in the question that the student has asked you, and that should be explored deeper. So this is actually an integral and interconnected process. And like I said, when you publish, when you do research, when you publish, finally, it will feed into your classroom also. So I think research and teaching is integrally connected. So if you want to be a good teacher, you have to necessarily be a good researcher. And so what happens is that research must become a lifestyle practice for all academics. So, and if it has to be a lifestyle practice, you have to follow certain techniques. You understand? It must be in, in built into your daily process, in, into your daily routine, your thinking process. So research is not something that you do, for example, say 10 days or one month in a year. You cannot do research. Research does not happen in that way. It's an ongoing, sorry, an ongoing process. Process of reflection, a process of deliberation, the thought process. So it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing activity. It has to be an ongoing activity. 
the moment you have a break in your research process what happens is that there is a disconnect and then it becomes very difficult for you to get back on track so what i'm saying is that try to make research as a lifestyle practice and if you want to make it a lifestyle practice you have to follow certain practices like certain rituals has to be followed and that is what the do's and don'ts are all about so like i said the most important aspect that you must consider right now is that research is extremely important it's a lifestyle practice and it's more than an institutional requirement because you want yourself to be heard by the rest of the world and research gives you that golden opportunity so i have now spoken a bit about the importance of scopus i have also spoken a bit about the importance of research of of transforming research into a lifestyle practice now i'll come to the do's and don'ts like i said earlier there are 11 uh, do's and don'ts that uh, i'll i'll uh, set out right now so the first thing is how does a, how how do you start your research the first and foremost is the million dollar idea you have to get that idea you have to get that research question and that question has to be worthy and worthy of exploration so it's extremely important that you get the million million dollar idea so you can do it in several ways first by reading intensive reading and then you find a gap in the literature and then you find that it's absolutely important that you fill this gap in literature so that is one way of uh, getting the, the the spark the spark for research then of course your passion you may you might be passionate about the environment or you might be passionate about uh, child rights so those kind of uh, uh, what is that your passion can actually spark off ideas and that can result in the development of a research paper then what happens is that like i told you earlier you may also get that spark from the courses that you teach it can come from students questions sometimes students can ask the brilliant questions and that can set you thinking a mind uh, into the thinking process and uh, it can also happen when you are preparing for your classrooms you might come across an interesting legal question which nobody has explored before before and sometimes it can happen through discussions in in the classroom it can happen through informal discussion with colleagues and when you attend seminars when you prepare for the seminars you understand so when you might get uh, questions from the panel so all these are different ways of getting that spark for your research paper so what you must do is when ideas come like what they say in the vedas let noble thoughts come to us from all sides so keep keep your mind open you should always keep your mind and your ears open because you don't you will that is the only way by which you can get more and more ideas and if you find that for example there is a recent decision by the supreme court or there is a recent legislation enacted by the parliament or there is a legal issue then what you do is you must strike when the iron is hot because people want to know immediately about the topic so one way of doing research is the idea but to get that idea you have to keep your eyes and ears open you have to be very uh what is that cautious and the more thing important has happened in society and there's a scope for you to write a paper on it go ahead for example kra now you hear a lot of a uh, uh, lot of controversy about kra project in uh, in kerala if somebody can write about kra and link it up with environmental impact assessment the need for environmental impact assessment as far as rail projects are concerned you will immediately get a publication offer so it depends upon the novelty of the topic so when i did my research on uh, ship recycling that was exactly the time when the international uh, maritime organization came up with this convention to regulate ship recycling so my study coincided with this uh, adoption of this uh, convention um, by the international maritime organization so there were people ready to take the manuscript for publication that is how i got the offer for, offer for publication similarly with regard to sea level rise sea level rise is the in thing so if you choose your topics wisely and there are a lot of virgin areas you will definitely get chances of a paper being published so please do not go back to uniform civil code those kind of um, what is that all those ancient archaic topics please omit them erase them from your uh, um, hard hard disk okay and going for fresh topics newer topics topics which where people are yet to research upon 
that is the that is one of the methods by which you can ensure that your paper gets into uh, a Scopus index law journal. Okay. So I talked about the the need for the spark, the million dollar idea. The second one is target. You have to set for yourself certain goals. The best thing is to set a very high target. For example, you decide, okay, this year I will be publishing three papers. Of course, finally you you may not be able to publish three you may publish let's say one paper and one paper is in the working so that is that itself is good so what happens is that you have to set for yourself certain very high targets ambitious targets and start work towards those targets now one way what i do is i have a whiteboard in my bedroom itself and i keep writing whatever i want i keep writing all my main topics that i have to finish so it helps me each time each time i get up in the morning of my bed, the first thing I see is my whiteboard, and I see okay, this article is at this stage. This article I'm not yet started. I have to collect materials for that. So that is one way of uh, by which uh, you can ensure that your thought process is always with regard to research. Okay. So ambitious targets, and you have to be hard on yourself. So it's like uh, delivering a baby. So I, I, uh, uh, it's a it's a nine month process, no. Similarly, with regard to writing an article, also it takes time. There is a there is hard labor involved. You have to sit for hours on end to produce your paper. So, but at the end of the day, of course, the rewards are highly sweet. So, but but the uh, the problem is the process. The process can be um, very what is that isolated. It can be intensive. It can take a toll on your health. But the fruits. Definitely, it's highly delicious. Now, the third important factor that you must consider when uh, um, uh, writing is that, like I told you, it has to be continuous and the time factor. See, what happens is that as far as writing is concerned and research is concerned, you cannot compartmentalize it. Like, okay, I'm getting vacations from August to, uh, let's say, um, October. Getting these, these many months of vacation for me. So I will put all my writing in from August to October and the remaining months of the year, I'll do my teaching. It will not happen. Your research will not take place. Research has to be a continuous and uh, what a continuous process. You have to be at it. You understand? So the, it cannot be that you, are, you can do your research only during vacations. It doesn't happen that way. See, the fact of the matter is that you may do your writing during vacations. But the most important part is that you have to keep on thinking about your research topic. Uh, you, you have to be at it. Only then can you do effective writing. Half of, uh, 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 half of a research project, a research paper, is all about what happens in your mind. How do you conceive the project? If you are able to conceive the project in very precise and clear terms, then things become much more easier for you. So what I'm saying is that Please don't think that uh, you can use your vacations for research or you need to have spe certain specific holidays to do your research. It will not happen. You cannot compartmentalize your research into vacations and uh, working days. It has to be a continuous effort. Your writing may happen during vacations, but the thought process has to go on right from day one. Then the, uh, another point that you need to take into consideration is you have written a paper, you have completed a paper. And then you have got your promotions. Okay, so you've got what you wanted. But immediately after that, so I've got my promotions, I've done a paper, the institution is happy. Okay, now I won't do research for the next three years. You are finished as far as research is concerned. The researcher in you will die. So what, what happens is that even if you complete your quota, you should think about the next topic because it's a continuous process. You understand? There cannot be any breaks as far as this process is concerned. So what you need to do is you should engage with new ideas. So one way uh, by which you can engage with new ideas is through seminars, attend seminars, attend conferences, do your presentations. So what happens is that you're constantly thinking about these topics and that will actually help you to do more and more research. So once you cut off yourself from the research process and take a laid back approach, it's extremely difficult to get back on track. So if you have done a paper, please start thinking about the next paper. It has to be a continuous train of thoughts. Now, now the fourth point that I want to, uh, I would like to share with you is the journal that you pick. 
Now, which journal do I pick? Now, who's the audience? Who's the audience for the journal? These are two important que and interrelated questions that you should keep in mind. So, when before you start writing or when you're in the midst of writing, you should always have a journal in your mind. So, which journal am I going to write for? Let's say you, you want to write for environmental law review published by Oxford University, Oxford University Press. So you have a journal in your mind. So don't start writing and then start hunting for a journal because it becomes very difficult. Because each journal has got its own specific criteria that you must fulfill if the journal has to accept your paper. So what you must do is you should at the time you start writing, you should always keep at least one or two journals in your mind. And then you pitch your article in that it fits into the broad scheme, the broad scope of that particular journal. And it's very important, I'm telling you that if you want to get maximum traction in the academic community, you have to talk, you have to aim for the top tier journals. The top tier journals. You have to find out whether the journal is appropriate to the paper that you are writing. Now you have generalist journals and you have specialized journals. Then the reputation of the journal, that is also extremely important. So one important thing that I want you people to notice with regard to generalist journals and specialized journals. For example, they can be a general, uh, uh, general journal on, let's say, uh, international law. Let's say Indian Journal of International Law. Let's assume it's Scopus Index. Now what happens is that you send your paper to this, um, uh, uh, the, 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 this Indian Journal of International Law and it is about biotechnology. And the, it's about, let's say, biodiversity. That's much better. Biodiversity. So what happens is that it's a generalist international law journal. So then the problem that happens is that you will have to face competition from a whole set of people, different kind of, um, uh, people publishing in different areas, but their papers have some connection with international law. So the competition will be much more intense. And you know the spots are very limited. So what you can do is, you should look for specialized journals. For example, if the topic is about conventional, I mean, um, um, what is that? Con uh, this bio uh, biological diversity, conservation of biological diversity, you may want to go in for a specific environmental law journal that deals with international matters too, but not for a general international law journal. So that is one important aspect that you may want to take into consideration. Then, of course, uh, the reputation of the journal is also extremely important. Then uh, um, there are other things. Uh, yeah, one uh, important uh, point that I would like you people to notice: uh, be strategic. Like I said, that once you have decided upon your journal, what you must do is you must go to the website of the journal and read all the, uh, um, the submission guidelines. You should be aware of the submission guidelines. So, if you go to the uh, website of a journal, there will be rules with regard to the word limit, the writing style that you need to adopt, footnoting. Time. So all these things matter when you write a paper. For example, let's say that uh, you write a paper, it's about 20,000 words and you have a journal in mind, but you have not gone to the website and seen the submission guidelines. Now what is going to happen is that by the time you finish the paper and you visit the submission guidelines, you come to realize that the word count that they uh, admit is only 10,000 words. So what happens is that you are saddled with about 10,000 words extra. Then what, what, oh, then uh, the problem that happens is that you will have to edit another 10,000 words and this can take at least a month. So it is extra work as far as you people are concerned. So what I'm trying to tell you is that please, before you start um, writing a paper, keep a journal in mind, go and see, visit the submission guidelines, read the submission guidelines and as far as possible, try to comply with the submission guidelines. The next important thing is, you should look at who are the members in the editorial board. What are they looking for? You should understand these things. Because generally what happens is that the members on the editorial board will be the ones who get the opportunity to review your paper. I said that papers will be sent for a double blind, uh, a double blind uh, peer review process. So what happens is that they may generally send the paper to the members nominated on the editorial board. And it is strategic, if possible, if you find that any uh, one uh, a particular member on the editorial board has written on the same area where you have written your article, 
please read his papers and his or her papers and try to quote cite those papers that will do a lot of uh, good as far as your paper is concerned i'll tell you what happened to me from, from my personal uh, experience so i wrote this thesis on my phd thesis on sea level rise and there was a report by the intergovernmental panel on climate change ipcc so they in 1990 they appointed a subcommittee to study about coastal zone management and sea level rise so this report was long forgotten but uh, i did my thesis about 2014 so this uh, report is completely forgotten and what happened is that when i started writing my uh, dissertation i cited this thesis i said, sorry i cited this work of the intergovernmental panel on climate change now what happened is that the examiner was actually one of the members of this uh, committee which actually did this study on sea level rise and he was very elated he was extremely happy and elated and he even wrote in the um, the thesis report that he was extremely happy to find that this report has been cited by this candidate so that is one way by which you can impress for me it happened uh, because of sheer luck but you can actually position yourself in such a manner that understand who are the members of the editorial board and see uh, if any one of the members of the editorial board have actually written on the area that you are writing and if possible try to cite that person so that will give you some traction as far as so that's what i said be strategic you should have a strategy in place and this can save you a lot of headache later on now reading reading is extremely important because if you have to uh, write you need ideas and one way to get ideas is through effective reading so only if you are a good reader can you be a good writer so these are all interconnected things so one important um, um, uh, point that you must keep in mind when you are trying to aim for good scholarship is the importance of reading and so what happens is that when you are reading for a, a, a research paper you read first a quick reading and thereafter you find that the paper has got lot of elements which you may need to incorporate as far as your research project is concerned you do intensive reading and when you publish more and more the the good thing is that you get a chance to read more and more papers now one important point that you must keep in mind when you are uh, researching is that please also read other kinds of uh, works works which are not directly related to your field but related cognitive disciplines so read uh, materials from cognitive disciplines too for example let's say the problem of climate change so there are scientific uh, uh, journals there are law journals there are law articles there could be matters of economics so the best thing is you start reading some of the papers which is written from an economic perspective so it will give you new sets of ideas a new ways of thinking Now let's let's talk about this concept of sustainable development. So we all know that sustainable development is all about balancing environment and development. So sustainable development has got many other considerations. When you examine it from a sociological perspective, from an anthropological perspective, from a legal theory perspective, there's a different dimension to sustainable development. So the thing is that if you're writing a paper on sustainable development, you bring in that interdisciplinarity. then what happens is that the chances of acceptance is very high so what i'm telling you what i'm advising you is that please read in your own area but then supplement it by reading from uh, areas which is beyond your field so that will actually enhance your knowledge and will bring new perspectives as far as your paper is concerned now one important point is with regard to writing how do i write now this is a major drawback as far as indian academics are concerned because we english is not our first language so then we are all seriously handicapped when we start writing and unfortunately the problem that happens is that we get exposed to complex writing because most of our judges like for example justice krishnaiah he writes in a very complex manner he creates his own vocabulary so what happens is that when you try to a such great judges their writing style unfortunately it will not be accepted as far as western academy is concerned or scopus academy is concerned so what you must do is you have to write in simple language see when you talk when you communicating when you doing or when you are involved in oral communication i am now presently talking about a topic you are listening to me if you have any doubts 
you can ask me questions and i am sitting standing right in front of you and i'll be able to clarify those doubts but as far as writing is concerned the author and the audience there is a complete disconnect you don't know who your audience is who is going to read the paper you have no idea and at what time you write a paper today maybe 6 years down the line somebody will read your paper so the question is 6 years down the line the person is going the person who is reading your paper has to understand what you have written because he cannot come and ask you no this is what you is what you intended or is it something else is there a contrary opinion what did you actually intend by this paragraph i am not able to understand i am not able to figure out in oral communication it is possible to stop you and ask you then and there but with regard to written communication that option is not available so what happens is that if you want your work to be understood by your audience you have to write it in the simplest language possible do not use words the meaning of which you yourself don't understand i have seen uh, in most uh, um, academic papers it's become fashionable to quote um, i mean to use different kinds of words which the meaning of which nobody understands i am sure that the the author would be having a thesaurus looking at the thesaurus and putting up these words but the problem is that if you want to effectively communicate your idea make it as simple as possible and and the problem that i find i mean that uh, all this was pointed out to me too when i went to canada to do my phd these questions these aspects were pointed out to me that my writing is extremely complex what do what, what do i mean by this particular word why did i use that word in this sentence why am i writing in such complicated sentences so i had to reinvent myself as far as my writing style is concerned so please understand that write in simple language if you want your paper to be accepted writing in simple english is a sign of good and effective communication it is a sign of scholarship because you are trying to communicate now i told you that most people have a tendency to write in long sentences a sentence itself is like a paragraph that is also a, 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 a strict no as far as journals are concerned creme de la creme journals will not accept such kind of uh, um, sentences so what happens is that your average sentence the length of your average sentence should only be 20 words if it's more than 20 words break the sentence into two sentences see you may have a long paragraph and in that paragraph generally the average uh, sentence length should only be 20 words but occasionally you may have a longer sentence but please, please be very careful and strictly adhere to this rule of 20 words in a sentence okay now the second thing is we have a tendency to write in passive passive language for example we uh, like for example um, there's a very uh, famous sentence you know it was rama who killed ravana we like to explain things in passive language see what happens is that the audience particularly this um, academic community what happens is that you're talking about most of the scopus index law journals are either european or it is american okay so what happens is that you're writing for that kind of an audience so you have to be very careful in north america and in western countries what happens is that they prefer active over passive sentences so instead of saying that it was rama who killed ravana you can directly say rama killed ravana see how many words you have been able to reduce so that is the magic of writing in active sentences it's direct communication and you reduce the amount of words the number of words that you are actually uh, using in a particular sentence then um as far as paragraphs is concerned the paragraphs generally have to be very short it has to be short and sweet and, and it must contain one idea max one idea so what happens is that when you start a paragraph start with a topical sentence for example uh, let's say cats are good hunters and then the whole paragraph is about cats the hunting habits of cats so what you have done is you have actually introduced the, uh, the reader to a topical sentence and you have given them sufficient uh, uh, what is it understanding as far as the contents of the paragraph is concerned so keep your paragraphs short and sweet try to have only one main idea in the paragraph 
convey one main idea and start your paragraphs with the topical sentence. And when you write your paper, always remember this golden principle of head, body, and tail. The head should always be the head. The head cannot become the tail. So if you follow this particular strategy of head, body, and tail, I am sure a lot of problems can be resolved. And once you follow this principle of head, body, and tail, you should divide your paper into different sections and subsections. And you have to have short and informative headings. It has to be short headings. See what happens sometimes is that we have a tendency to add more drama as far as our headings are concerned. Sometimes it may work, sometimes it may not work. So as far as possible, to be on the safer side, try to have informative headings and divide your paper into sections and subsections. Now, when you end, when you conclude your article, the best way to conclude your article is to give a power punch. For example, I'll tell you, I uh, my, my book on ship recycling, I completed that uh, whole manuscript. The last sentence was, let the dead ships rest in peace and not torment the living. That was my last parting sentence. And uh, there was a review done on this book by the Hindu and they specifically quoted the sentence. So it's a power punch. You understand? So your conclusion should be extremely uh, well organized, contain the main points that you have already expressed earlier on. And as far as possible, try to end your article with a power punch. Then in between, summarize your papers, summarize your, uh, the main argument. For example, you have a whole section. And then at the very end, you must summarize what you have said in that particular section. So the reader will be able to refresh his memory, will be able to understand and, and, uh, and uh, will be able to appreciate the interconnections that have happened between the different parts. So interconnect the paper properly. Now, one more thing that you must consider when you are writing is, you might be an activist, you might, be, you might have strong feelings about uh, child rights. So, but the problem is when you're doing a piece of scholarship, your activism should not actually permeate into that scholarship. You have to be a bit dispassionate. You can, of course, put in your activism, but use milder language. You understand? It should not be that it's uh, uh, it's uh, um, uh, like uh, too activist in nature. The language should not be too activist in nature because that might... Uh, uh, not be that might not be appreciated by the editorial board. So what you must do is, even if uh, the paper is a big bit of an uh, activist in nature, what you must try to do is not get carried away, but try to use dispassionate language. And the next point is edit, edit, edit. There is uh, there is no substitute to editing your paper. Keep on reading your paper and try to find out which words are unnecessary. The best way to communicate as far as writing is concerned is use uh, as uh, little as words as possible to convey. So please remember these things as far as writing is concerned. Writing is a whole art. It's a very important art. And once you have completed your paper, don't immediately send off your paper for submission. What you must do is just shut yourself off from the whole activity. Just give you give yourself two three days and then come back revisit the paper and then you will be able to understand inconsistency that there were inconsistencies in the paper so what you must do is once you've completed your paper give you some give yourself some time a, a, a break of a few days then revisit the paper and then try to find out what are the inconsistencies you may want to share your paper with uh, in one of your colleagues that is one good way. You can have a faculty seminar, like you can present your research findings and you can get faculty feedback, feedback from your peers. That will also help. Then another way that you can ensure, um, what is that, um, a, a publication is through collaborations. Collaboration is definitely a good idea. But when you collaborate with a colleague of yours to write a joint paper, what you must do is you have to delineate the rules precisely beforehand. Otherwise, later it might lead to um, a bad, uh, I mean, uh, the relationship turning sour. So, if you want to avoid that, uh, definitely enter into collaborations, but beforehand delineate the precise roles. Okay. 
Now, when you have a collaborator, what happens is that it becomes much more easier on your part because you have a person with whom you can brainstorm your ideas, you can exchange your ideas, you can exchange your perspectives. And this itself can enrich the quality of the work. Now, another way to do, I mean, um, to help you lessen the burden is to ensure that you appoint student interns. So student interns can do the basic research. They might be able to dig out uh, materials from Manupatra or um, what is that, um, or other online sources. So appoint student interns, give them the task, the responsibility to find out primary research materials or secondary research materials. And once they collect the materials, ask them to prepare a bibliography and give you a bibliography. So you will know what exactly have they done. And based on that, you can take your research further. Now, the next most important point that you must consider, the eighth point is with regard to methodology. So when you write your paper, you must at the very introductory paragraphs itself clearly state the research question. You have to state the research question in the most express language possible. And then you have to show the different various parts of the paper. How do, how do those various parts interconnect with this research question? How is the research question related to the various parts? This aspect has to be clearly brought out Internet cases and try to do a study of different sets of cases to understand the judicial reasoning. Okay, so what happens is that basically there are different tools and techniques to make doctrinal research very interesting. For example, you can use principles of interpretation to analyze a statute. You can bring in the golden rule, the mischief rule, and then say that this statute is because of these reasons it might foul, uh, it might fall foul of the constitution. You can use data, you can use information to analyze cases, to analyze situations and thereby make the discourse, make doctrinal study very interesting. Now in this context, I would like to draw your attention to a classic book by uh, um, my professor, of course, Professor Kismi Mams and Professor Girishankar's uh, teacher also. Dr. Jay Kumar has written a classic book on the nature of the judicial process. In fact, I learned the art of judicial process by reading that book. The way in which Professor Jay Kumar has analyzed the cases, that itself shows how beautifully he has employed doctrinal scholarship. So if you want to know more about doctrinal scholarship, you should have the power of observation. Observe what others are doing. See, it's not that everybody can give you a list of a checklist. This is what you do in doctrinal scholarship. It doesn't happen like that. You have to analyze and observe what others have done. So this is a classical work, this um, nature of judicial process by uh, Professor Jay Kumar, if you get a chance, please read it. Even when I was in Canada, I had a copy of that book and I used to keep on referring to the way in which Professor Jay Kumar has done employed doctrinal scholarship. So I would always advise you people to please look at that book to understand the beauty of doctrinal scholarship. Now, the next important thing is comparative. So if you want to have a Scopus paper, it's comparative is one uh, important comparative method. Use of comparative methodology is one way in which you can a better chance of your paper being accepted. 
So when you do comparative, you must understand that comparison is not about saying, okay, this is the position in Australia, this is the position in the United States, this is the position in the United Kingdom. That is not comparison. You are just providing information. You have to analyze what have you compared. What are you trying to compare? Are you comparing apples with oranges? So you have to specify the criteria, the basis for comparison. You have to bring all these elements together and then draw conclusions based on this comparison. That is the art of comparison. Unfortunately, most scholars, they stop at saying, this is the position in Australia, position in England, position in US. That is not comparison. You have only done one part of the comparison. You have to take it to a different level. Then, of course, interdisciplinary. Interdisciplinary studies, it's now very much in work and very much appreciated. Now, in every discipline, let's say science, Law has an important role to play because, see, for example, some of the recent developments in science, it can result in violation of human rights. So law should always be there as a means or, or an instrument to control human behavior. So when you talk about interdisciplinarity, there are so many issues that you can actually write on. For example, let's say in the endosulfan aerial spray, spraying, which happened in uh, Kerala. You can talk about uh, uh, the consequences of the pest, um, I mean, the health disorders that happened as a result of that pesticide spraying and how it affected local communities. That is a very important piece of, uh, that will definitely be an important piece of scholarship for which you would have takers. I talked, I told you about the K-Rail um, uh, project, then Mulla Periyar Dam. See, nobody is writing about the Mulla Periyar Dam. You have this dam, it's a very big serious issue in Kerala and we don't have scholars actually trying to understand what exactly is the legal issues brought to, to the core by Mulla Periyar. How does the Dam Safety Act interact as far as the Mulla Periyar dispute is concerned? So recently we had that, uh, um, what is that, um, an issue of the elephant, you know, once somebody, um, 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 what is that, gave a, put a dynamite inside a pineapple and fed it to the elephant. So what are the, uh, what are the uh, so-called rights, if possible, as far as captive animals are concerned? So there are so many issues about which you have the chance of writing, but people are not taking it up because the problem is that we are not thinking in those terms. The research should be a lifestyle process. When it becomes a lifestyle, part of your lifestyle, then what happens is that you will immediately be able to find out. When a particular topic comes up before you, you will immediately be able to find out that there is a scope for a paper as far as the topic is concerned. Now, I talked about uh, interdisciplinarity, empirical research. This is the minefield. Be very careful when you do empirical research because what happens is that in the United States, they have statistical software. In universities abroad, they have statistical software to analyze data and that is how they draw conclusions. We don't have access to statistical stock software to the best of my knowledge. So when you are employing empirical um, uh, methods, please explain the methodology beforehand. You have to sound practical. You have to sound real. For example, let's say that you are doing a study of child labor in Haryana, uh, let's say Madhya Pradesh, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh. Do you think it's humanly possible to do a study incorporating all these states? It is not. The editor will immediately understand that you are trying to, you might have done it, but the problem is that it is humanly impossible for an ordinary person to do it. Unless and until you clearly explain the methodology, you clearly explain your sample. Otherwise, they will uh, construe it, construe it as, uh, as you have fudged the data and they will reject the paper. So when you are doing empirical research, please be very careful and please explain your methodology and your sample beforehand. Now, the next important point that I want to talk, talk is about uh, plagiarism. See, of course, I don't uh, think that academics indulge in deliberate uh, plagiarism. But unfortunately, what happens is that there are two, two, uh, two um, uh, um, uh, what is that? Um, I'm not getting the right word. There are two possibilities of plagiarism as far as an academic is concerned. One is inadvertent plagiarism. You may have forgotten to put a footnote, or your paraphrasing was not up to the mark. That can result in an allegation of inadvertent plagiarism. Number one. Second thing is self plagiarism. Because you might have one article, you have already published it. Please stop looking at that article. Once it is published, it is done. Throw it off. Go to the next one. Don't keep on revisiting that and trying to make 
new castles using old uh, um, um, damaged material that is already over what is none is done so when you are um, getting into projects do not go back on your research and try to what is that recycle materials unless and until it is properly cited you have proper permissions you have to be extremely careful of navigation of plagiarism so what i am suggesting as far as plagiarism is concerned you must paraphrase and rigorously footnote that is the only way by which you can avert an allegation of plagiarism and it may also be a good idea to use turn it in uh, check your papers for any possible plagiarism if there is try to rectify the plagiarism and then um, the similarity i won't say plagiarism the similarity and then resubmit the paper for to the to the concerned journal now the uh, tenth point that i want to discuss is with regard to rejections see it's very rare that you get a straight out acceptance in a good journal very rare uh, i recently wrote a paper on water federalism i sent it to some of the american um, law journals and uh, two three law journals then and they rejected the paper but finally um, one uh, american law journal they accepted the paper so what happens is that it's always a question of finding the proper journal that's extremely important and if you find the proper journal you might get a like acceptance a straight away acceptance but generally what happens is that rejections is the norm okay rejections are normal no, sorry rejections are normal so don't get you know, what is that disheartened if you, if you get a rejection because if you get a rejection in one journal there is always the possibility of a next journal that is why i showed i mean i um, brought this example of my own personal example of sending these papers and getting rejected so don't get disheartened because there is a rejection there is always a better journal okay and one more thing is merely because you are a big name in the field that does not automatically guarantee acceptance because it's a double blind review okay the reviewer does not know who you are so the reviewer may reject your paper for xyz reasons so what happens is that sometimes even in rejection or they can be review and um, resubmit what happens is that you might get comments and that is extremely important comments is extremely important so don't think that the comments that the reviewer has given is basically to uh, put you down or to humiliate you don't think in those terms it is basically to enhance the quality of the paper you may not agree with all the comments to understand but there would be certain comments which will be highly pertinent so identify those important uh, those comments try to reflect on those comments and as far as possible try to respond to all the comments all the comments given by the reviewer certain cases it may not be possible to respond to certain comments just leave it like that but as far as possible try to um, uh, respond to uh, respond to the majority of the comments given by the reviewer okay so what i do is when i get comments i make a table the comments given by the reviewer and then in the next column i will write as to how have i addressed a particular comment given by the reviewer so then what happens is that when you send this to the editor the editor will know for sure that you have incorporated those comments where have the changes been made and then that can guarantee you a possible uh, offer for publication so respect constructive feedback you understand respect it is constructive feedback which actually enhances the 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 beauty of your scholarship so don't not do not get disheartened by rejections if there are comments please incorporate the comments and enhance the paper if that journal is not taking it there are other journals who may take it so it's not it's not a battle that is completely lost now the 11th and maybe perhaps the final point that i have to say is avoid predatory journals see unfortunately even though we give a lot of uh, importance and respect to scopus the fact of the matter is that even in scopus there are a large number of predatory journals okay now as far as this predatory journals is concerned they may ask you for money never pay a single penny to any of the journals for publishing your paper it's, it's better not to publish than pay money and get your paper published so that will uh, put you to further discredit so the best thing is do not publish in predatory journals if any journal is asking you for money avoid them like play okay so how do we identify whether a particular journal is a predatory journal or not 
I think the best thing is visit the website. If they don't have a website, I think it's better not to uh, uh, not to indulge in that journal. The second thing is check the website. If they do have one, check the editorial board. So you'll understand whether they're credible or not. Then, of course, even within Scopus, I told you that there are predatory journals. There are several low-hanging fruits, not the top journals, but they are Scopus. Some of them manage to scrape into Scopus, but at the same time, they're not highly credible. But the fact of the matter is that the review process may not be as rigorous as what you can expect as far as the uh, creme de la creme journals are concerned. But what I would suggest is that if you want, you can publish in these low hanging fruits too. It doesn't matter because they are also scopus. But the fact of the matter is that once you get experience, once you develop your confidence, please do not go for low hanging fruits, go for the top ones only. Okay. Now, there are several, I mean, as far as India is concerned, we have very few um, journals which are recognized by scopus. For example, we have Economic and Political Weekly. That is a Scopus recognized um, uh, journal, Economic and Political Weekly. Then we have Asian Journal of Legal Education. That is Scopus. So um, that is actually uh, being edited by Professor um, uh, uh, Professor Manoj Kumar Singh. Yeah, the Indian Law Institute. So you can publish there at Scopus. Then of course we have the Jindal Global Law Review, but of course the process is more rigorous. Then uh, uh, we have, uh, um, I mean, uh, apart from that, I'm not sure whether we have Indian, Indian law journals. Uh, th there are uh, uh, several others. For example, there is statute law review. So those who are doing um, research on statutes, legal statutes, they can get their paper published in statute law review. And a lot of Indians do publish in statute law review. Okay. So uh, this is some of the main points that I wanted to say. So. As far as uh, uh, this uh, do's and don'ts are concerned, I'll just uh, uh, quickly tell you, it all starts off with an idea, the basic idea, the million dollar idea. Then of course, your target, set high targets for yourself. Then it has to be continuous, research has to be continuous and the time factor. You to apportion your time and use your time uh, more effectively. Then which journal do you choose? How do you pick your journal? That's extremely important. Then be strategic, read the website, understand what are the guidelines that they ask for. Then read not only your subject area, but also related cognate disciplines. Read and understand. Writing, as far as writing is concerned, make it as simple as possible. Do not use words for the sake of using words. Using uh, what is that uh, new terms does not necessarily convert you into a legal scholar. So the best thing is make it as simple as possible. Then the methodology. Doctrinal, doctrinal is interesting, doctrinal is and can be highly exciting. A classical example is the nature of the judicial process. Then of course you have comparative scholarship, interdisciplinary, empirical, please be careful with regard to empirical, explain your methodology and your sample. Plagiarism, uh, the, the possibilities are inadvertent plagiarism and of course self-plagiarism. Then rejection, take rejection on your stride. Do not get disheartened by rejections. Rejection is part of uh, being an academic. It's part of the academic life. If you get rejected in one journal, there might be, there is, a, of course, a better journal out there waiting for you. Then finally, avoid predatory journals. So these are some of the basic do's and don'ts that I had to um, tell you. Then finally, uh, I'll conclude my paper by again uh, re-emphasizing the fact that as academics, it is our bounden duty to indulge in knowledge creation. We are not consumers of knowledge, we are producers of knowledge. We have to be producers of knowledge. And research has to be part of your lifestyle. And this can be done through continuous motivation, self-motivation and of course your peers. They provide the ideal environment to motivate you. And as far as scholarship is concerned, the research is concerned, there is no blueprint. You have to create your own blueprint. You have to create your own style as far as publishing is concerned. Now, what I have to tell you is that you should use Scopus Publishing as an avenue for learning, as an avenue to build and develop your own scholarship. And one way that you can do is, I think most of you might, might have completed your LLMs or your PhDs. You have papers, potential for papers in your LLM thesis as well as your PhD thesis. Go back and revisit your LLM uh, thesis and your PhD thesis and see how many papers can you cull out of it. I published my first article from my LLM thesis, which I did at Karyavatam, 
campus. It was on tribal, my thesis was on tribal land alienation. And I converted that and got it published in Cochin University Law Review. Since then, it has been a long journey. And each time you write, it's a learning, it's a whole learning process. And things become much more easier for you as you grind in scholarship. Okay. So please revisit your LLM dissertations and your PhD dissertations and see whether there's a possibility of pulling out articles from that uh, because you've already done your research. Your basic research has been done. You have it right in your house. It's only a question of developing it, transforming it, and making it into the form of a paper. So that's all I have as far as Scopus is concerned. And I hope that uh, my two cents on Scopus publishing, it has proved or it will prove beneficial to all of you. And once again, I express my gratitude to my SP ma'am and of course to Professor Girishendra sir for having given me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Now, if you have any questions, I'm uh, uh, willing to take them. Yes. Um, okay, so we have one question uh, from uh, uh, Surbi, uh, how to identify predatory journals. I think one way which you can identify predatory journals is to visit the website of the journal, you understand? So that will, uh, um, uh, once you visit the website, you'll be able to understand what exactly is happening as far as the journal is concerned. See who are the people who are writing in that journal, go to past issues and you find out who is writing in that journal? That's very important. Second thing, the editorial uh, committee. Who are the members of the editorial board as far as the journal is concerned? And then another way to find out is, are they asking you for money? If they're asking you for money, just avoid them. Okay. You, you will be able to understand whether it's predatory or not. If they ask for money, the website is not very win. It's not up to the mark. You find it, uh, it's intuitive, you understand? More or less intuitive. So these are some broad parameters that you can uh, use to identify whether the uh, journal is predatory or not. I hope I have answered your questions, Sudhi. Any other questions? Yeah, quotations. So as far as possible, um, um, uh, keep quotations to the minimum. You understand? Suppose uh, uh, what happens is that in a particular uh, article, if you have quotation every third page, the problem that happens is that it is not your paper. You are just compiling information written by somebody else. So as far as possible, if you have a quotation, try to paraphrase the quotation and keep the quotation, lengthy quotations in your paper. Maximum to one automation. So it will be a straight reject. So please ensure that quotations are kept to a minimum okay the nature of the uh, uh, judicial process by uh, dr nk jay kumar okay. manupatra is not actually um, um, uh, please do not uh, look at manupatra for uh, journals see manupatra journals and all is just uh, very juvenile please do not go for manupatra journals see you people have it in you that is what i'm telling you. most of the people i meet i tell them that you have it in you if i do it you can also do it there's nothing uh, nothing um, great. it's just a question of pushing yourself to it what is on the list if you are going to publish Please put your heart and soul into it and then try to ensure that you publish only in proper uh, Scopus Index Law Journals. There are several law journals, 900, almost 940 law journals in Scopus. Try to find out one or two good journals in your area. Work towards it. Uh, my first paper was actually published in a magazine called Kerala Calling. It's a government of uh, Kerala publication. I published there. Kerala Calling. I got, I got 700 rupees for it. I still remember and value that money. But what I'm saying is that from there, if I could publish in uh, an international law journal within a matter of 10 years, 
it's possible for each and every one of us it's just that we need to push ourselves to it so please do not publish for uh, online journals manupatra those kind of things expect no Um, um, uh, um, Dr. Harita is asking, is it compulsory that only paper with empirical study? It is not necessary that papers with empirical study will only be accepted uh, by Scopus Index journals. Scopus will accept even, I told you, know, it will accept even doctrinal studies. It will accept doctrinal studies. You look at the journal. One important journal is Statute Law Review, which is published by Oxford University Press. It is all about legislations. So you can use the principles of interpretation, write a critique on a legislation, send it to statute law review, and God willing, it will get accepted. So please do not be under a misconception that only empirical studies is accepted for Scopus Index journals. Scopus accepts. Scopus does not have any power. It is the journal which accepts it. You please understand. Scopus is only an index. So the journal, the concerned journal, for example, let's say um, Environmental Law Review. They will publish papers which have got empirical, which have got doctrinal, which have got um, uh, comparative. So it's not a problem. Okay. So online journals, I would prefer uh, only if it is brought out to some of the top um, universities. For example, let's say um, 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 Columbia Journal of, uh, Journal of Asian Law. That is an online journal, but it's brought out by Columbia University and that has been recognized by ADPC. So that is a good, uh, but don't uh, send your papers to Indian online journals. I don't think it's worth your effort. Put in some more effort and try to get it published in a Scopus Index Law Journal. Scopus, Scopus Index means uh, what happens is that Scopus is actually an index. You have seen an index, no? So it's got the name of all the journals which they have recognized. That's what Scopus actually means. There are, there are several other indexes also, but we're not concerned about that because Scopus is what now uh, they take into consideration. I'm not sure about uh, whether all Scopus index journals are included in UGC careless. I think it should be a bit different, slightly different. I'm, I'm not very sure about the UGC notes. I don't know about that. Either. I'm, so, so, I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, getting an ISSN number does not give any advantage to, to a journal. It does not give any advantage. If you have Parvati, if you apply to ISSN, or a number, it will give you also the number. So it doesn't give any added advantage to your publication. You understand? You have to ensure that it goes into a proper, that that, that is what makes Scopus so important. Because Scopus, they are an index and they have taken a set of journals which gives them credibility. You publish there, it gives you more credibility. Scopus has got journals like Ocean Yearbook. In my area, Ocean Yearbook is very important. International Journal of Marine and Coastal Law. These are the areas that journals that I know. Then, of course, Environmental Law Review published by Sage. You understand? Columbia Transnational Law Review, Stanford Journal of International Law, Harvard, all the kind of top notch journals. Then, of course, you have, a, you have plenty of journals. What I can do is I can send you the list of journals to Professor Bisney and she might uh, I mean, uh, uh, distribute it to all of you, send it to all the participants. I'll send it to Professor Bisney and yeah. So ISIS, ISSN or ISBN does not give any particular advantage to a journal. Mm. See, advice to postgraduate students who are interested in research after their PG, how to choose a topic. See, choosing a topic, I told you, you know, you have to keep your eyes and ears open, wide open. You understand? Like K-Rail. K-Rail is a classical example where you can write a research paper or you can write a paper about, see, any topic that comes to your attention, you, you, you should have the ability to see whether there is a scope for a paper or not. That comes through, I mean, of course, it's, it's got a lot to do with your own intuition, but it comes with experience. You understand? Certain topics, uh, I really don't know what to, how to say it in precise terms, but it comes a lot with intuition and your experience. Get the point. Okay. Effective comparison, the position in US is not sufficient. Um, yeah. How I do it properly is I have to find out certain common elements, try to develop trace, I mean, try to develop certain core elements, uh, which I use to analyze the position in US, the position in India, the position in UK. 
that is how we do it you understand so when you set out the position of us let's say for example let's talk about the dam safety act okay dam safety act you have um, the position in us whereby which you have the federal laws but you have state pro state laws as well you understand it's a combo of federal and state in india it is at the federal level that we have passed the dam safety act in canada it is at the state level from provincial level in australia also it is at the state level so you you have this particular information so then you develop a common factor you understand and that common factor can be the level at which the law has been enacted that's a common element then you will say under the us it is at the state level in canada state level in australia but in india it is like this and then you find out why is it so like this in australia why is it so in india what is the advantage when it is at the state level what is the advantage when it is at the central level like that you create a comparative frameworks you have to develop a comparative framework barely setting out the position is just half of the uh, work of of the comparison that you are doing if you want to take it to a different level you have to find out core elements that will actually facilitate the comparison you understand uh, open access journals is basically uh, the information i mean the, the the article is available to the general public for that what happens is that journals may charge you money if you have to make it open access and that will cost a fortune you understand for example nordic journal of international law or international community law review those kind of journals you want to have it open access you will have to pay through your nose the best thing is no open access if they publish it that itself is good um so in scopus journal references will be accepted or i did i didn't quite understand your question references will be accepted See, generally what happens is that in they please understand that scopus is only an index it is only a list like you go to a grocery shop you get a list of grocery items no menu card that is what scopus actually is you understand now That's what is a chili chicken you have to buy and eat now same way you have to have your interaction with a particular journal and you have to follow the rules and regulations of that particular journal so scopus is nothing but just a list they do not have any power with regard to your paper being accepted or rejected that is an individual uh, decision made by the journal concerned you understand so you have a journal let's say environmental law review okay so what happens is you check the scopus website to find out whether that journal is indexed in scopus if it is indexed in scopus check uh, check for that but then what happens with regard to your publication Uh, as far as the journal is concerned, is something that you will decide. I mean, you you will have to do it with regards to the editor of the journal. You understand? You have to comply with all the requirements that the journal has set forth in its submission guidelines. You have to see the submission guidelines, read the submission guidelines, and then work your paper in such a manner that it meets all the criteria that the journal specifies, and send the journal. And if it gets accepted. good for you because it is already scopus that is how it happens you understand so scopus is nothing it is only a list it's like a grocery list that's it nothing more but it's a very powerful grocery list so what happens vis-a-vis a particular journal depends upon the quality of your article what the editorial board wants and whether you have complied with all the requirements set out in the submission guidelines that is all what scopus is